It is good to see you tonight. I hope you're all doing well, that you're having a good week. If you have any updates to our prayer concerns, please get in touch. Give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you if you have anything that we need to be praying about or if there's any way that we can serve you or help you as a congregation. If you have any questions or concerns about the study tonight, I hope to uh, hear from you. Also, please remember we are continuing to meet every Lord's Day morning at 9 o'clock for one service for this time being, for at least a month or so over the past several weeks. And so we're kind of keeping an eye on how things go in Madison and Dane County. But if you need help signing up for that service on the Sign Up Genius account, please get in touch with me or with Kenna, and we would be glad to help you through that. Uh, right now, I'm at Blue Mound State Park. I have been interested in... Uh, pitching a tent in the winter somewhere and seeing if I can survive a night in the snow. So I'm waiting for a snowy day and I came out here this morning, this is Wednesday morning when I'm recording this, and kind of hiked around here a little bit and found the bike and hike in spots. The uh, backpacking spots are closed at Governor Dodge State Park right now so I thought I'd be a little bit closer to home at Blue Mound and scoping it out a little bit. So far I haven't seen any other human beings <laughs> and so in that regard it's so far so good and we'll see how this goes but I'll do a little bit of uh, looking around here today to see how it goes but we'll see how class goes and hopefully the wind isn't a concern. I'll listen to it before we broadcast it tonight before we upload it to YouTube and if needed I will uh, redo that uh, in my garage. Tonight we get back to our study of the book of Luke. And by way of review, and in case you might be joining us for the first time, we want to know that Luke is a Gentile. He is a medical doctor. He writes both Luke and Acts to a man by the name of Theophilus. And he makes a point of writing in chronological order. This is one way that Luke is a little bit different from the other three gospel accounts. He also makes a point of including those people who are often overlooked and sometimes oppressed in the ancient world, including women and widows and Gentiles and Samaritans, as well as the sick and the poor. And so we see that a number of times spread throughout the book of Luke in a way that we really don't in the other three gospel accounts. In our study that has gone on for several months now, we are now just a few days away from the Lord's crucifixion. And tonight we pick up with Luke chapter 21. So tonight we are in Luke chapter 21. Last week, following a series of challenges from the scribes and the Pharisees, the Sadducees had a challenge of their own. But if you were here with us, you may remember that Jesus embarrasses them publicly and pretty much accusing them of not knowing the scriptures or the word of God. Uh, we then had the scribe asking Jesus which commandment was the greatest from the parallel accounts. We had the brief summary of Jesus condemning the scribes for their hypocrisy. And then we closed last week with the first four verses of Luke chapter 21. And the reason is, as he leaves the temple on Tuesday afternoon, he sits down to watch those who are giving. And so he is there for the purpose of observing the people who are donating to the treasury. And Jesus notices that the rich are giving huge amounts, and apparently they're making a huge deal out of it. They are doing that to be seen. But then there is a poor widow who puts in two small copper coins, and Jesus says that this woman has now given more than everybody else put together because she gave not out of her surplus, but she gave everything that she has to live on. And as we learned last week, that is pretty much the Lord's last public teaching. As far as we can tell, most, if not all, of everything Jesus says from here on out is said uh, to the apostles privately. And so when Jesus leaves the temple after that observation, after making those comments about the poor widow, he heads out of Jerusalem with his disciples and then he walks from the temple to the Mount of Olives, which is the next place that we're going to see Jesus. Uh, the Harmony of the Gospels will be very helpful tonight. In case you're interested, the Harmony is available on Amazon for around $25. It's basically just the four Gospel accounts arranged in columns parallel to each other so we can compare and contrast between the two so we have everything arranged and laid out very neatly, very nicely in chronological order. Uh, the Harmony is especially helpful in the last week of the Lord's life before His crucifixion. We have a lot going on in the four gospel accounts and most of the book of John gets added in here from chapter 13 of John forward uh, so the harmony is especially helpful with all of this and what's really helpful is the chart on page 349 next to the last opening in the book the authors list the events of the last week 
along with the section numbers. They break this down by sections. That's the way uh, Thomas and Gundry arrange their particular harmony. And so they put that in chart form right there near the end. So that's very helpful. So tonight, for example, we'll be looking at what they label as section number 202, I believe. And so we can then go to the back of the book. We can look up section 202 in the chart on page 349 and we find that what we're about to study most likely takes place on the Tuesday evening of the last week before the crucifixion. So it's very easy to plug it into the chart and to figure out where we are time-wise. So tonight then as Jesus leaves the temple after teaching all day on Tuesday, after watching the people giving, he walks with his disciples from the temple toward the Mount of Olives. And so that brings us to Luke 21 verses 5 through 7. That's where we're picking up tonight. And you'll notice that the formatting on the screen is a little bit different for our first section or segment tonight because the accounts in Matthew and Mark are especially important in terms of understanding what in the world is going on here. We have a little bit of a intense section, a little bit of a confusing section if we don't lay it out in a, in a good way. But we're going to start with Luke's account in the right-hand column, Luke 21, 5 through 7. And while some were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, As for these things which you are looking at, the days will come in which there will not be one stone upon another which will not be torn down. They questioned him, saying, Teacher, when therefore will these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And so as we look at what's happening here, notice in verse 5 that some of the disciples are talking about the temple. So on their way out of the temple, they notice, and they bring this up with the Lord. They notice that it is adorned with beautiful uh, stones and these votive gifts, these things that people have donated through the years. And, and so his disciples are asking about this. In Matthew's account, the disciples come to him to point out the temple buildings. In other words, Jesus, look at this. Look at this amazing thing. Mark has the disciples saying to Jesus, Teacher, behold what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Well, we combine these three accounts. We need to realize what's going on here. Where are the disciples from? Well, for the most part, they are from Galilee. What do we know about Galilee? As I've said before, Galilee was the Lodi of ancient Israel. And I say this with love. I say this with the utmost respect. I love Lodi. <laughs> I love our church families who have come to Lo uh, from Lodi. I've done some hiking up beyond Lodi at uh, Gibraltar Rock, just a beautiful part of, of this area. And I've joked with them before about this. But in my mind, Lodi is the country, at least compared to where we live in Madison, Lodi is the country. I think most of us would agree with that. Uh, so we have the city of Madison, and then we have Lodi. And I think it would be hard to find two cities in Dane County that are more different from each other than our Madison and Lodi. One's a big city, one's a small town. And I've also used Lodi in this illustration before because, like Galilee, uh, Lodi is also north of here. So we need to keep this in mind. Jesus comes from a place like Lodi. Uh, Jesus did not grow up in a big city like Jerusalem or like Madison. No, Jesus comes from a small village. Uh, Jesus grows up in Nazareth. Of course, he was born in Bethlehem. The, his parents flee to Egypt. They go back north. Once it's safe, they settle in Nazareth, and that is considered to be the Lord's uh, hometown. It is a small farming community about 65 miles north of Jerusalem. And it is a small village in the middle of nowhere, as we would say today. And most of his disciples come from this area as well, up there around the Sea of Galilee. And so with this in mind, after Jesus has been teaching and preaching primarily up in Galilee for the past three and a half years, he now comes into the big city. So we have this backwoods country carpenter having these intense religious discussions with these highly educated religious experts. So these guys have the equivalent of PhDs in religion. So highly educated, uh, very just brilliant men. And Jesus comes in from the country. He's blowing them away in terms of his logic and his knowledge of the scriptures. And after a day or two of this, as they leave the big city, what do the disciples do on their way out? Well, they are mesmerized by the architecture. They are amazed by the huge, beautiful buildings. We don't have this stuff back home up in Galilee, kind of thought. 
And I think about growing up near Chicago. When you get off the train downtown Chicago, how do you know who the tourists are? Well, the tourists are those who step out of the train station and they are walking around looking up. And they're not looking at where they're going, but they are looking up at the huge, magnificent, beautiful, ginormous buildings. And, and that's, how you, that's how you trip and fall into the Chicago River. This is how you get mugged. Uh, this is how you annoy the locals, we might say. But, but it's a very natural reaction. In other words, this place is not like home. This is absolutely amazing. Uh, back when I was a student at Fried Hardeman University, there were two brothers who lived down the hall from me in my dorm, Daryl and Damon. And they were both from Finger, Tennessee, about 20 miles south of Henderson. And as far as I could tell, these two young men had never left the state of Tennessee. I wouldn't swear to that, but just by the way they talked and interacted with me, some of the things that they said, they, they were from rural Tennessee. They had probably never left that area, at least for any length of time. And I went to their house a few times. We were friends. And their house was in the middle of nowhere. I thought Finger was in the middle of nowhere. They lived out in the country from Finger. And for some reason, I had to make a rare trip home on a weekend back home to the Chicago area. It was so, so far, I didn't do that often at all, usually just for the summer and the uh, winter and break and so on. But I invited them to go with me. And it's just a quick trip. We're going to drive up all day Friday, be with my family on Saturday, drive back all day on Sunday, be here for class on Monday. Well, Daryl agreed, and so we drove from Tennessee. We drove and we drove and we drove 500 plus miles, whatever it was. And toward the end of that day, as we were coming around Chicago, Daryl woke up <laughs> and he sat up in the passenger seat and he said, wow, that, that is a huge McDonald's billboard up there. Would you look at that? I've never seen a billboard that huge. That is a ginormous McDonald's billboard. We're probably going 55, 60 miles an hour. So this happens quickly. And as we get closer, again, wow, what? That, that is a huge billboard. And suddenly he realizes, whoa, there are people inside the billboard. There are people there. There are people on the inside. And like that, it was behind us. And he turned around and he, he kept looking at it out the out the rear window. Well, we had just driven under the Des Plaines Oasis, where they used to have a McDonald's restaurant over the interstate. And those of you who have driven down there in the past are familiar with that. I think they've closed it now. I don't know if they've reopened it or not. I haven't been down there for a while. But of course, with all the construction, they had to widen that right there. And so I think that may be gone now. But I share this to point out that Jesus' disciples might have been a little bit like that in Jerusalem. Here we have these country fishermen, and they are amazed by the huge, beautiful buildings in the big city. However, instead of being impressed himself, I want to point out that Jesus gives a pretty negative response, doesn't he? As for these things that you are looking at, the days will come in which there will not be left one stone upon another, which will not be torn down. And that leads us to the disciples' response, to Jesus' response to their observation about these buildings. And I've highlighted the disciples' response here because I think it's clearer in Matthew than it is in Mark and Luke what they're actually asking. They're actually asking not just one question, but it seems that they're asking a series of questions. So they're basically asking, when will these buildings be torn down? That's number one. Number two, what signs do we need to be looking out for so that we can get out of here so we're not here when this happens? And then finally, number three seems to be a third question here. When will the world be ending? You see that at the end of Matthew there in verse three, and of the end of the age. So uh, three questions here. When will the buildings be torn down? What signs will there be? And when will the world be coming to an end? And they might not even realize that they're asking a series of questions because I believe in their minds, if these buildings get torn down, that is the end of the world as we know it. In Luke, however, they only seem to be asking two questions, when and what are the signs? But in Matthew, we have that third bonus question about the end of the age. And we can't fault the disciples for asking these questions though, because what Jesus says here is incredibly shocking. It is mind blowing in their minds. They're overwhelmed by the buildings. They can't even imagine some of these things. So there's no possible way 
for them to even imagine everything that they can see being torn to the ground. But these questions are important, I think, to understand what's going on here. Because there are actually two events being discussed in this passage, not just one, as the disciples assume. In reality, we have the destruction of Jerusalem, the tearing down of that temple, not one stone left on top of the other. We've got that situation. And then secondly, we also have the end of the age or the end of the world, the final judgment or the second coming of Jesus as we might describe it. Okay, um, we won't spend too much time in Matthew's account, but I, I've gone there for now. So we're kind of getting away from Luke. We're going back to Matthew because Matthew's is a lot more comprehensive. And Matthew's account has a pretty nice distinction between these two major events. Again, we won't be reading all of Matthew 24, but as I understand it, Jesus pretty much answers the question about the destruction of Jerusalem first. And that's in verses 4 through 35 of Matthew 24. And the basic message is, watch out for the following signs. And then he lists a number of things. Wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, and, and on and on and on. And he says to his disciples, when you see these things, when it gets to this point, you guys need to run for the hills. You need to get out of there. Um, the Romans are attacking, but you can avoid that destruction by leaving. You can get out. And notice in verse 34, Jesus specifically says, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. In other words, some of you people standing here today, if you can hear the sound of my voice, you will see these things happen. Well, Jesus is speaking these things around 30 AD. And if our understanding of this is true here, which I believe that it is, there are some of those people hearing those words who will actually see with their own eyes the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And so as I see it, everything in verses 4 through 35 in Matthew 24 refers to the destruction of Jerusalem. But notice there is a huge transition that takes place in verse 36. It's as if Jesus is switching now to answering the next question concerning the end of the age. And notice Jesus says at this point, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So Jesus says, basically, I don't even know when that other day is going to happen. And so concerning the destruction of Jerusalem, there are signs. The people could flee, they could avoid it if they paid attention. On the other hand, there will be no signs leading up to the Lord's second coming. In fact, Jesus is pretty clear here, as I said, that even he doesn't know when that day will be. And if he doesn't know, then certainly there's no way for us to know. And so for the rest of this chapter and into most of Matthew 25 as well, Jesus emphasizes over and over and over again that there will be no signs whatsoever before his second coming. It will be a surprise in every way, completely unexpected, no warning at all. It'll be like the flood back in the days of Noah, worldwide, unavoidable, uh, unavoidable with no warning signs at all and so on. In my own Bibles that I've used through the uh, years, I've sometimes put a line between verses 35 and 36 as a reminder. We have signs and signs and signs and signs. Get ready, run to the hill so you can avoid the destruction. And then boom, verse 36, no signs, no warning whatsoever. And the answer is not running. You know, there's no way to run from this second event. But the solution for the second event, the second coming, is simply to be ready at all times for the second coming. There are two events, 70 AD in the first half of this chapter, and then in the second half, after verse 36, the judgment day at some unknown time in the future. We need to be careful with this because some people confuse the two events. And so they have created this huge system imagining that we somehow need to be uh, predicting the Lord's return based on signs that we see around us. Haven't we seen that? Uh, there'll be a big earthquake or there will be some huge war breakout and people will say, ah, it's a sign of the end. Uh, the Lord's return is imminent. But we need to remember the signs were in the first half of Matthew chapter 24. That was with reference to uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, but with the second coming, there will be no signs at all. And so we need to be aware of that distinction. Uh, we sometimes see this in our songs. I almost hesitate to mention this because um, we can almost always find fault with any song that is written by mere mortals. Uh, but think of a song like Jesus is Coming Soon. That's probably the worst example of all of these. 
Uh, troublesome times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we all hold dear, now is at stake. Are we familiar with that song? Jesus is coming soon. Morning or night or noon, many will meet their doom. Trumpets will sound and the dead shall rise. Righteous meet in the skies, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Love of so many cold, losing their home of gold. This in God's word is told, evils abound. When these signs come to pass, nearing the end at last, it will come very fast, trumpets will sound, and so on. Uh, supposedly, we have signs around us uh, right now indicating that the end is near, wars and rumors of wars and, and all of that. And, and sometimes I uh, almost cringe when I sing it. I, I try to assume the best. Uh, personally, I don't lead that song, but I can, uh, in a way, justify singing it by rationalizing in my mind, uh, yes, indeed, Jesus might be coming soon, uh, in the sense that he could come at any moment, and so in my mind, that's one way I, I can kind of justify it, but uh, I don't know. Let me know what you think about that. Uh, but I just say all of this to, to get us ready for the rest of Luke chapter 21. So th this is the background, and I, I point out Matthew 24 because it seems to be more uh, clearly divided, more distinctly divided in Matthew 24 than it is uh, anywhere else. And we need to kind of keep Matthew 24 kind of in the back of our minds here as we press forward because we can use Matthew 24 as something of an outline. So let's move forward then to Luke 21, verses 8 through 19. Luke chapter 21 verses 8 through 19. And he said, see to it that you are not misled. For many will come in my name saying, I am he and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified. For these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. Then he continued by saying to them, Nation will rise up, arise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes, and in various places plagues and famines, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves, for I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. But you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name. Yet not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. So up at the beginning, we've got this warning. Do not be misled. And the reason is, there is a lot of misleading going on in the world out there. Many people will try to mislead you on this, especially when it comes to prophecies like this. Whenever we're talking about future events or prophecy, it's very easy to uh, speculate and to try to pretend we know what we're talking about when we really don't. However, do we remember the, the penalty under the Law of Moses? for somebody who prophesies something that doesn't happen. You remember the penalty? Death. They were to be stoned to death. Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22. And so the warning from Jesus is be very careful. Don't be misled by what people say on this topic. If somebody comes to you and says, troublesome times are here, filling men's hearts with fear, the time is near, he's coming quickly, don't listen to that person. We are not to be deceived in this area. Now going into this, let's keep Matthew 24 in mind from the parallel account. The first half of the chapter is about the destruction of Jerusalem. The rest is about the Lord's final return, the end of the world, and that. And so with this in mind in verse 9, as he does in Matthew and Mark, Jesus warns about wars and rumors of wars. Don't be terrified because these things need to happen first. But this, even this, isn't the sign of the end. In verses 10 and 11, we have political uprisings and turmoil and earthquakes and plagues and famines and terrors and floods or whatever, signs from, from heaven. Before this, according to verse 12, the church will be persecuted. They will lay their hands on you. They will persecute you, delivering you over to the synagogues and prisons, dragging you before kings and governors for his name's sake. Just a question here. Did these things actually happen before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD? Absolutely they did. You may remember for a while, Saul led the persecution around the Jerusalem area. Then he was converted, and, and then he was on the receiving end of a, of a lot of that persecution, along with many others. 
coming to something of a climax in the mid-60s A.D. Notice in verse 13, the persecution will give them an opportunity to testify. Did that happen before kings and governors? Well, absolutely. That's what happened with Paul as he preaches to Felix and Festus and a number of others and eventually makes his way to Rome at the end of the book of Acts. Back here in verses 14 and 15, Jesus tells them, don't defend yourselves. Don't worry about what you'll say because he will give them wisdom. He will tell them what to say. Mark's account attributes this to the Holy Spirit. And again, let's remember, this is not today, is it? Remember, this is leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem. This isn't leading up to the end of the world. Back in those days leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, would tell them what to say. We need to make sure we fit this in with the timeline. Uh, the last few verses describe the persecution, that it would start with their own families. Their own parents and brothers, relatives, friends will turn them in. They'll be hated by everybody. And yet, if they listen to the Lord's warning here, if they leave Jerusalem as directed, none of them will get caught up in the destruction. That's my understanding, at least, of the Lord's promise in verse 18. Not a hair of your head will perish. But instead, by their endurance, they will gain their lives. Matthew and Mark both say, but the one who endures to the end, he shall be saved. And Matthew adds, and the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. Well, my question here is, was the gospel ever preached to the whole world before the destruction of Jerusalem? I believe that it was. Seems that it was, based on Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, where Paul refers to the gospel having been proclaimed to all creation under heaven. That's something Paul wrote in the early 60s AD. And so it seems that, yes, the gospel has been preached to the civilized world, or to the whole world at that point. Um, either uh, earlier in the parallel accounts, Mark has Jesus saying, and the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. That goes back to uh, Mark chapter 13, verse 10. And again, going back to what Paul says later in Colossians, it seems that that, in, in, that indeed is the case. Okay, let's go on to Luke chapter 21, verses 20 through 24. Luke chapter 21, verses 20 through 24. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city, because these are the days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. In the parallel accounts, you might notice that Matthew and Mark both include something right before this. Jesus' reference to the abomination of desolation, Luke leaves this out. But he picks up with the reference to Jerusalem being surrounded by armies. When the city is surrounded, Jesus says, then what I'm warning you about is about to happen. And notice the solution is to leave the city. If this is talking about the end of time, will leaving the city do any good? Absolutely not. That's, so again, that's not what we're talking about here. This is not something you can run from. This is like the flood under the days of Noah. You can't run away from that, but this you can. So if this is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, as we believe that it is, then yes, running will do some good. And so the Lord's advice to his disciples here is, when you see the surrounded, uh, city surrounded, leave, get out, get out of there. And, of course, we think that's obvious, but we know what happens. Uh, back then, the natural reaction to seeing your city surrounded would be what? To get inside the city, to prepare, lower the gates, get, get in there, get safe, get protected. Uh, but Jesus says the opposite because he knows what's going to happen. He knows that Rome will level the city of Jerusalem. And so he tells his people, watch for the signs. And when you see the city surrounded by the Roman army, get out of there. And if you're out in the country, don't enter the city. Again, that's the opposite of what most people would think. These are the days of vengeance, as he says in verse 22. This is the fulfillment of prophecy. Then in verses 23 and 24, Jesus gives a special uh, warning or woe, we might say, on those who are pregnant or nursing. It'll be especially difficult for them to run or to get out at that point. In Matthew and Mark, he also tells them to pray that this doesn't happen in the winter. 
or on the Sabbath, both of those situations would also make it more difficult to run or to get out of there. I know we don't think about Jerusalem in the winter these days. At least we don't picture Jerusalem with snow, but they do have snow from time to time. Um, and he says, basically, just hope and pray it doesn't happen during the snow because it'll be more difficult to escape. At the end of the paragraph in Luke, we have at the end of verse 23 and end of verse 24, it's not found in the other accounts. It's the explanation that Jerusalem will fall by the sword and that the residents will be led captive into all the nations. They'll be taken away. Very similar to the Babylonian captivity that happened previously, many hundreds of years before this, trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. And this will be the fulfillment of prophecy. At this point, Matthew and Mark both include a few more items not included in Luke, not found here. The warning about false Christ, false prophets, uh, the reminder that Jesus has told them about these things in advance. In other words, when these things happen, remember I told you so. Remember I warned you. And take that as a reminder that everything that I'm saying here is absolutely true. Okay, let's move over then into Luke 21, verses 25 through 36, which is the next section here. Luke 21, verses 25 through 36. There will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and on the earth dismay among nations, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they put forth the leaves, you see it, and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life, and that day will not come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of the earth, but keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. You might notice a man-made heading over this paragraph in your own Bibles. Mine says, Second Coming of Christ. And yet, we need to remember that these headings are not inspired. Those are man-made, inserted by the translators, and may be a little bit misleading. And I, and I say this because there is some apocalyptic, there is some symbolic language here, and also because this paragraph comes before that key division back in Matthew 24. As we arrange this in parallel fashion, this passage comes before the split between the event with signs and the event with no signs. So this comes with reference, as I understand it, to the event with signs. So it seems to me uh, that this paragraph needs to be taken figuratively with reference to the destruction of Jerusalem. Since there are signs, the reference to the fig tree, for example, in verses 29 through 31, um, otherwise, it would seem to me that Jesus contradicts himself, suggesting looking for signs when he clearly says that there will be no signs for the second event. And, and this is why we started tonight with that summary of Matthew 24, emphasizing that split between verses 35 and 36. I, ho I hope we're all following together here. Uh, but back to Luke 21, 25. Jesus says there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth dismay among nations. In Matthew and Mark, Jesus refers to stars falling, to the sun being darkened, to the moon not giving its light. And so the obvious question is, are these references literal or are they figurative? Are they symbolic in some way? And in context, I would tend to take these as being more figurative or symbolic. Um, the picture of the sun being darkened and the picture of the moon not giving its light. I find interesting that these have all been used before in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, in Ezekiel, and are used in those passages to describe times of great suffering and great political turmoil and upheaval, including the fall of Babylon, including the fall of Egypt. Uh, we also have similar language used figuratively in Joel and applied by Peter to the church being established in Acts chapter 2. Uh, the same goes for the imagery in verses 26 and 27 about the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Um, this has also been used figuratively in the past. And so uh, the idea that the Son of Man is coming in judgment 
Uh, and in a sense, that happened. God judged the nation of Israel in 70 AD. And so if these references can be used figuratively and applied to the fall of Babylon and the fall of Egypt, and if they can be applied to the church being established and other events, uh, then certainly similar word pictures can also be applied to the destruction of Jerusalem and do not need to be uh, necessarily taken literally. In fact, in verse 8, Jesus says that when this upheaval starts happening, uh, referring back to everything he said up to this point, when all of these things happen, get ready, because the time is near. Again, there are signs to look out for. And to illustrate this further, he tells a parable about a fig tree. And the illustration is, uh, we know what's right around the corner. When, um, uh, when nature starts sprouting, uh, when trees bud, and, and when flowers start blooming, and that kind of thing, we can, in a sense, predict the future. Uh, here in the uh, state of Wisconsin, we do the same thing, don't we? We see the daffodils pop up, and we know what's about to happen. Sometimes they come through the snow, even. But we know spring is about here. We see the construction barrels pop up. And we know that mosquito season is almost upon us. We see the forsythias bloom. And we know it's time to put the crabgrass preventer and the fertilizer on the yard. Well, in the same way back in the first century when the disciples see these signs that Jesus is talking about here, then they need to get out of the city of Jerusalem so they can avoid what's about to happen. And from history, we know that it happens in AD 70 as Jerusalem is leveled by the Romans. And in a way, the key to understanding everything up to this point comes in verse 32. As Jesus explains, as we saw earlier from Matthew 24, 34, that this generation will not pass away until all of these things take place. And so again, this is not something that we are still looking for today. This is not the end of the world being discussed here. This is not the second coming or the judgment. But this is the destruction of Jerusalem that happened within the lifetime of many of those who heard these words for the first time. In the parallel account over in Matthew, we have now come to the big dotted line, the split between the destruction of Jerusalem and the second coming, the split between the two questions. And the Lord ends this section with the reminder, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. This is where Matthew has Jesus saying, but of that hour, uh, of, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. And so the discussion transitions uh, to the second coming, and even Jesus doesn't know when all of this will be. In the last few verses, we've got the reminder to be on guard. Do not get distracted with drunkenness and the worries of this life. Otherwise, that last day may come suddenly upon you like a trap. And it'll come not just on those who dwell in Jerusalem, but it'll come upon all of those who dwell on the face of all the earth. And so the solution is not to leave the city, at least on the second part. The solution is to be ready at all times so that we can escape, not the city of Jerusalem, but so that we can escape and stand before the Son of Man. That seems to be a reference, as I see it, to the judgment, the final judgment. I uh, Think about the description of the Son of Man in the book of Revelation, as we've been looking at it this past Lord's Day and coming up this Lord's Day as well. Uh, the only way to stand is to be ready. And at this point, Matthew goes on to give a series of parables, emphasizing the importance of being ready. Uh, the parable of the master who leaves town, leaving his slaves in charge and returns at an unknown time. Uh, the parable of the wise and the foolish bridesmaids at the beginning of Acts or uh, at the beginning of Matthew 25. The parable of the talents in Matthew 25. And then that whole description of the judgment with the separation of the sheep and the goats. The passage where Jesus explains the final judgment in terms of to the extent that you did these things to the least of these, you did them to me. And so on. All of that would get inserted in here time-wise. Well, this brings us to a good place to a pause for tonight. Hopefully next week, if the Lord wills, we'll pick up with verse 37. If you have any questions about what we've studied tonight, I would encourage you to go to christiancourier.com. As I've recommended a number of times before, do a quick search for Matthew 24. Wayne Jackson has some great uh, material on this discussion of the destruction of Jerusalem as opposed to the end of the world and the final judgment, this big distinction that we've tried to make tonight. Uh, if I can, I'll try to link an article or two in the description of the video as well as in the email and also in the comment section on the Facebook live stream group. But we do have some very good uh, resources available to us. Uh, thank you so much for being together with us tonight, either online or on the phone. Uh, be sure to send me your prayer concerns so I can get those in the bulletin at some point before Saturday. I would appreciate that. Uh, we have a number of our members who are traveling. We have other people who have traveled here. 
uh, to be with family. So let's be praying for that situation. Uh, this coming Lord's Day, it's very important we sign up on the Sign Up Genius account, if at all possible. And if for some reason that fills up to our 25 limit, uh, do not despair. Do not lose heart. Uh, give me a call. We'll work with that and we'll see what we can do. But uh, we don't want anybody to be turned away if at all possible. But it's important to sign up sooner rather than later. If you can sign up tonight, that'd be great. And we'll know what to do if we get really close to that limit and, and go from there. But hope to see you at 9 o'clock this coming Lord's Day morning. Uh, let's close tonight with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus to this earth to save us. And thank you for the constant reminders in your word to be prepared for the judgment that's still coming when this life is over. We pray that we would take the time to encourage each other to stay faithful as we see that day drawing closer. Thank you for making us a part of your kingdom, the church. We ask that you would be merciful to us, that we would show also mercy to those around us. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.